So this is hot composting. More compost, less time. So uh, I'm sure that most of you are wondering what this is all about and what the less time is all about. Well, let me tell you that we can go from, you know, what looks like, you know, real vegetable matter that's, you know, things that you can pick out in a, in a compost, like carrot scraps and all that stuff, to basically decompose matter in somewhere around 18 days. So it's a lot less time than the typical cold composting. So that's what this workshop is about. And as noted on this page, it's um, the actual uh, first workshop. So to begin, um, I'll give you guys an outline of what we're actually going to be talking about today. Um, so first thing we're going to be talking about is a virtual tour. So in this workshop, I always do a uh, tour of the, the garden and, and the homestead of Flat Rock and what it is and all that stuff. So we're going to do that. Um, that's part one. And we're going to say, yeah, who the homestead at Flat Rock is. Um, what is the homestead at Flat Rock? And then we're going to introduce what we're actually going to be talking about today. So that virtual tour is pretty short. short. I'm going to introduce the concepts of conventional versus regenerative agriculture. Those are often terms that are coined in, you know, the, 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 the growing world, the agricultural world. Um, and especially these days with talks of climate change and whatnot, regenerative agriculture is kind of a big deal. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And how adding organic matter matters. And, you know, a lot of people tend to go towards fertilizers, but I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about things. And you're going to realize that or adding organic matter is really what matters. In part three, uh, we're going to talk about types of composting. So there are quite a few types, um, and uh, it's not going to be an in-depth overview of it all, but it will be um, some, I guess, uh, information about different types. And they may be actually interesting types that you might want to try at home that are actually fairly easy. In part uh, number four, we're going to actually get into what it is you came here to see, which is the hot composting component. And then part five is really session two of workshop number two. And I call that one, let's get composting. So I'm actually going to build a compost pile. I'm going to show you how I collect my materials. I'm going to show you the three bin method. I'm going to show you um, some of the tools that you might need in order to do it. And really kind of show you that it's, it's not that hard. And when, once you see somebody doing it, it's actually um, quite an easy method for composting and and it's 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 pretty like it's not that it's really hard to screw it up there are a lot of ways to fix it if you run into problems so to begin um part number one i guess where we'll do a virtual tour uh, as i said this is something that i've always done on the group so um and the first thing we're going to talk about is the homestead of flat rock so who and what um, well, we're a family that really wanted change, um, and to do that, we, we set some goals to deal with issues surrounding energy security, energy uh, insecurity, food security, climate change, and a whole bunch of stuff that kind of came up, and we realized there were kind of some of the things were all linked together, and we kind of came up with a plan that was, it was about three years, and we took some year, you know, three years basically to implement it. And uh, of course that implementation is still on the go, but uh, for the most part, a lot of it is complete and we're just adding little things here and there. Um, and like I said, we set a timeline to execute those goals. And that, that was about, it was about three years and the rest, well, it's flying by the seat of our pants. So in year one, um, to deal with the energy security goals and the fact that what I wanted to do, I couldn't do where I was previously living. So I figured, well, we're going to need more land and I'm going to need to build an energy efficient house. So we set out to build Newfoundland's most energy efficient house. And in summer number one, and that was kind of as soon as we moved in, it was really the first stage of the garden. And in that gardening, we, we brought in basically topsoil and we created beds 
and you know simple operations using hand tools shovels and a tiller and there was lots of help from little ones which was which was quite fun to see you know having children involved in it um worked out really well she enjoyed it and things like tilling which now i'm starting to realize the things i'm kind of moving away from um but at the time um it did need to be done so i purchased a tiller and was using a tiller for mixing and whatnot so in order to be able to i guess you know have all of this food and store it you need somewhere to store massive amounts of food and really what that comes down to is to do that passively without the use of energy the only way to do that really is with a cellar so we set out to build a cellar in that first summer also so there were a lot of things on the go um so i had a concrete company come in and they did some footings it's not really big it's about seven by seven and there's a vestibule on on the front and you can see looks like a little hobbit house going underground and it's about seven by seven and about seven feet tall and you can actually fit a lot of food in there if you stack it properly using the right right things so it's it's actually really 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 spacious we also spent most of that summer nurturing and tender tending to the gardens and learning about all kinds of stuff including covering your crops it was a big mistake made in year number one because we knew nothing about it. it was our first year ever trying to grow anything yeah so we learned that you really need to cover your crops so i did cover some things later on but at that point it was uh, it was pretty late and we had a lot of issues with root maggot and all kinds of stuff um but you live and you learn so that that's that's kind of how you move forward so in summer two the big thing was crop protection um we also worked a lot with trying to figure out how to extend our season um once again you know deal with food security so goal number two was kind of growing year round we had some composting in place but it wasn't really enough to feed a garden um so you know we created raised beds and uh, found a way to cover them with uh, row cover and these guys worked out really well for brassicas so the root maggot issue went away um pretty much everything in the in the garden was pretty good but um we we also decided yeah to grow year round so this was the year that I worked on a greenhouse. And we also worked on the, uh, I guess, trying to grow year round crop selection for that stuff. And we were quite successful that first year. It was, uh, it worked out really well. So in summer number three, uh, it was the additional livestock. And um, we decided to add chickens. And, and once you start raising your own vegetables, you start realizing that um, there's actually you know you, it's actually a great source for inputs in the garden um and it's almost a necessity uh if you if you have a large garden um we started working on the addition of fruit fruit is kind of something that's really hard to to get going and it's such a long-term investment that i sometimes have found it hard to kind of get into it but i put in an honest effort and planted some apple trees and half gaps and strawberries and then also grow more types of vegetables for, for storage. So here's our chicken coop. Um, my neighbor calls it the Hen Hilton. Uh, it is quite the coop, but when I built it, it's, it actually doubles as a storage shed and, and also stores uh, about a year's worth of chicken feed if I need to store that much, um, you know, in case of supply chain issues and whatnot with everything on the go with the pandemic. And here's our strawberries, the first picking being boiled down into jam. And here's me shoveling with the, with the chickens around. I actually like those chickens quite a bit. They're, uh, they're fun to have around. And of course the benefit to that is you have fresh eggs all year. And a source of meat, you know, should food security become a real, real issue. Uh, although their eggs are definitely worth more than their weight in meat, if you ask me. Um, and summer three yeah so here there are eggs this guy's a whopper i think it was 105 grams which is huge for a chicken egg and here's something that we put together with everything in our garden some asian inspired noodle ball thingy that has a whole bunch of stuff in it and it actually looks quite tasty and it was all right so in summer three the other plan was to ramp up composting um which really is kind of another step in self-sufficiency 
Uh, we did need to have a plan for manure management from the town, so it only made sense that composting now was something that we were going to have to ramp up because we knew that we were going to have chicken bedding, we knew we were going to have bedding in our run, we knew we were going to have chicken manure that we were going to be scooping daily, so you, you got to do something with all of it. And it didn't make sense to acquire feed and then turn it into eggs, but then to have all this manure and just throw it away in the garbage. Like, some people do that, but, but it's such you know, good inputs that, that you can do stuff with it. And luckily, with hot composting, is a great, it's a great way to deal with, with manure. So lots of inputs in your garden, um, scraps from your garden, leaves, um, like I said, chicken bedding, manure, uh, kitchen scraps. I mean, they're all things that are great uh, to hold on to so that you can, you know, put them in a compost of some sort. I use a three-bin uh, composter, which you see here. It looks a little different than this now, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's the same, but a little, little different. I think it's, paint, it's been painted. So in summary... Um, it was a multi-year project that was aimed at food security and insecurity, and I would say that for the most part, you know, we've, we've done pretty well with it. I think we, I can give myself a thumbs up on that one. Uh, energy security and insecurity, definitely a thumbs up. The house has performed very, very well, um, and, you know, it's great to have, you know, ex I guess extra money to be able to do things that you need to, you need to do or to, to not be paying large energy bills. Um, and of course, we also explored, you know, really new and old technology for growing and storage. I mean, greenhouses aren't new, but, you know, with the addition of the insulation and turning it into a super insulated structure, we were able to grow year round. So that's kind of the new technology side of it. And the old technology of a uh, cellar. I mean, cellars are, you know, a very, very old technology, but they work really, really well. And they're purely passive there there's no energy source the energy source is sun um you know and and really it's the uh, the earth itself um you know and that that cycling of seasons that that leads to it cooling and warming is what keeps your 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 food fresh all year uh, or at least eight months of the year for sure and of course you know we we work to kind of you know, push some permaculture based methods through, you know, to, to boost fertility, which is really, you know, trying to get our chickens free ranging and they, they kind of do what they need to do in the, in the fall and the spring and they help fertilize the garden and whatnot. Um, they do some work for us by dethatching and, and eating weeds um, and we recycle whatever it is that they create into back into the garden. So it's, um, you know, it's a it's a waste not uh, situation. It, uh, it's worked out really well. Okay, so part two was really just uh, the introduction. So I'm, I'm going to move right into talking about conventional agriculture. And I guess conventional agriculture, I guess that it, it, it treats soil as if it were a medium to grow in. That, that's really what it does. And that medium is composed of organic components, um, which are really the living and the dead matter. So it's the worms, the bugs, the fungi, the, the bacteria, uh, nematodes, all of those things. And inorganic components, which are the things like the sand, clay, minerals, rocks, all of those things that, that, that were never ever alive. They're, they're, just, they're just, you know, the matter that's inorganic. And in conventional agriculture, I would say that, you know, after or I guess during and after, you know, the, the Second World War, uh, the push for agriculture, you know, kind of came from the fact that people realized, well, we can create these, these fertilizers, uh, inorganic fertilizers, and, uh, you know, you can feed these plants and they, they, they actually work really, really well. Um, so people decided that, you know, you could just amend your soil with inorganic inputs and, and plants would, would grow fine. Um, and of course, you would always determine what, how much to add based on the results of a soil test. So these days, you can take a sample of your soil, you can bring it to uh, an agricultural lab, and actually get it tested. And they can tell you, you know, what, what you're deficient in, and, and basically tell you how much you need to add. 
Um, and these soil tests are fairly cheap. I think they're seven or eight dollars or something. It's, it's pretty cheap. And it's, it's something that everyone should get done in their garden. It also tells you about lime and whatnot and how much to add. It's really just a chemical analysis. So um, the other side of a soil test is something that everybody can do at home, um, which is a texture analysis. And a texture analysis really is kind of looking at more of those inorganic components and what type of soil that you have. So what is a texture analysis? Well, people who have looked online about their soils may have heard people refine, referring to loams or, or clay or sand or sandy loam. These are all different soil types in terms of the uh, inorganic components. So a soil test, texture test is actually really, really easy to do. Um, you go grab a mason jar and you grab, you know, probably a, like a, a 500 mil jar and you grab about half of it filled with, let's say, dirt. You go your, wherever you're going to plant, you, you scoop up a half of it full of dirt. You put in about two drops of um, soap, like just dish liquid is fine. And uh, you literally, you fill it up with water almost to the top and you give it a shake. And then within two minutes, the first things that settle out are the heaviest. Uh, so that's your sand. So that, that's what you see on the bottom. And then the next thing that settles out kind of from two minutes onwards to two hours is your silt. Um, and then after that, basically two days, it's clay. So the clay is the lighter layer up on the top. And then above that is just water again. And then most organic components, they tend to kind of float around. So the soil texture analysis is really about the inorganic component. So for example, um, if I look at, let's say, you know, these testing jars, and you can hopefully all see them. Um, the first one shows, you know, somewhere around 10% clay, 10% silt, 80% sand. So that you can see that this is, this is really a sandy type of a soil. And then loam um, actually is kind of, in th it's almost in thirds. It's basically, um, you know, uh, a part clay, a part silt, and a, a part loam. And I'll show you this on a plot in a second. And clay has a lot of clay. But clay takes a long time to settle out. Um, and all of them can be beneficial in soil depending on what it is that you're looking for. So in number one, your sandy soil um, would actually be uh, down on the left-hand red dot. And um, the the loam is basically the red dot that's kind of in the middle. And then the red dot is up in the clay section is your last sample. And really what you're aiming for for most soils is to be in that loamy region. Uh, now here in Newfoundland, a lot of our soils tend to be very silty, um, probably due to glacial till if I were to guess, although I'm not a geologist, so I don't know much about that. But um, you know, the, they tend to be they tend to be more on the, the the silty side than the clay side, but I'm sure there are heavy clay uh, soils in Newfoundland also. All right, um, so conventional agriculture, chemical fertilizers. Okay, they, these are inorganic components, and typically we're always talking NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That's the NP and the K and um, then any micronutrients are also listed. So what's interesting is that everyone talks about adding orga organic matter, or you know, plants need all this organic matter, but what's funny is that plants actually don't uptake organic matter, they actually uptake inorganic components to grow. So that, that, that's interesting, and that we're gonna look at the link of that in a while, why organic matter matters. Um, but to keep in mind right now that plants actually uptake inorganic components in order to grow properly. So really chemical fertilizers provide exactly that, the inorganic components. Uh, so the good is that it provides the inorganic components necessary for growing. Um, and this is a diagram showing, you know, the, the, the NP and the K directly feeding the roots of the plant. Um, and that plant then is able to, to produce nice, you know, leafy greens. Um, and it interacts, you know, with the sun and the environment to, to give you a plant. And the little guys in the red down below, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, 
those are what we would refer to as micronutrients. And the beautiful thing about fertilizers is that they provide a predictable supply of nutrients. So they're good in that sense that, that you know it, the results are predictable. Okay, so the bad thing about chemical fertilizers um, is that it doesn't actually do anything to help build soil life. Um, and we're going to get into why that's, that's important. It, it doesn't provide any building blocks. So if we were to look at the difference between organic fertilizers on the left and synthetic fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers directly feed the plant. Organic fertilizers actually tend to kind of feed the organisms. And then the organisms in return actually provide nutrients that then the plant can uptake. So there's quite a different dynamic in terms of the way that chemical fertilizers and organic fertilizers behave. So people often talk about organic fertilizers as being fertilizers that are more long-term release. That's because they need to be digested, they need to be broken down and turned into components the plants can use. Uh, but keep in mind, of course, that, that, that those organic components, because of that, they help build structure in the soil. Synthetic fertilizers don't. They're basically salts. And those salts dissolve with water, and they provide predictable results. So the ugly, uh, this, so this is, of course, reference to the movie, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, is that um, basically overuse... Uh, and over fertilization can lead to runoff, um, algae blooms, and agricultural pollution, which is a huge problem. Um, and a lot of it's because we, we don't really understand how much we need to use, and that's why soil, soil tests are important. It's good to go get them done. You have a better idea of what actually needs to be added to the soil. Uh, and it does nothing to promote good soil health. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to build soil ecology, and we'll get into that. Uh, it actually leads to depletion of soil life because you're not actually providing anything for that soil life to actually absorb and use. And it can lead to the further degradation of, or, of the organic matter present in the sense that eventually all that, that dead matter, once it's consumed by whatever is in your soil, you know, it ends up becoming a dust bowl. There's nothing in it that, that can further support life. So eventually it just becomes a dust bowl, and now you have erosion issues. So, I mean, there's some huge problems with constantly using just chemical fertilizers. And this is a picture of an algae balloon. So you can see how ugly it can look, likely due to overuse of um, phosphate and nitrogen-based uh, chemical fertilizers. So I'm not going to say fertilizers, I mean, they're, they're not evil. Um, they do have a place in the garden, and they can really get you out of a bind if you're able to diagnose problems with your plants. But I would say the best thing to do before you start um, is go get your soil test. So in regenerative agriculture, soil is more complicated uh, than just a medium. Over the years, we've determined that it's actually a very dynamic system. And it's constantly changing uh, in response to the environment. So whether it be rain and water, uh, the addition of, let's say, animal excrement, um, leaves falling on the ground, they all help build, I guess, soil ecology. And really, I mean, the soil is really not just, it's not dirt. I mean, it, it's an ecosystem. Uh, and it has many ecological levels ranging from plant level, which is what we see, where that plant turns carbon dioxide into a physical structure that we can see above ground, to roots that are feeding off of, you know, the inorganic matter that's, you know, cycled by all of these living, um, you know, things on the ground, whether it's fungi, bacteria, and, you know, all these orders of organisms that release nutrients back to the soil by the consumption either of living or dead matter. Um, and these are all grouped according to being primary consumers, secondary consumers, high-level consumers, and they all provide back to that nutrient release. And this is not new. I mean, this, we've known this for a long time. So soil ecology actually plays a huge role in sequestering carbon and in our ever, I guess, our, our never-ending goal of trying to beat climate change. Um, it actually can, can be a huge 
uh, benefit to us if we can actually harvest things the way that, that we need to by using regenerative agriculture. Uh, and we can do this simply by feeding the soil rich organic matter so that uh, things can build soil ecology um, and we can build soil life and uh, build crops and whatnot. And uh, really it, it just builds that living mass of so plants, animals, insects, fungi, bacteria, etc. And you don't really think about how much bacteria is in soil, but there are billions and billions sometimes per, per cubic centimeter. So that, that although we think of them as small and insignificant, you know, it all has mass. So, um, you know, as long as it's, it's living or in a state of being dead and not decayed, it's actually sequestering carbon. So what do plants need? Well, uh, plants need water, and we know that they need mineral forms of N, P, and K. And we're all told basically that phosphorus um, actually, you know, promotes good fruiting health um, and good flowering health. And uh, nitrogen, of course, is you think of green, green growth, and potassium is needed for overall health of the plant. Now, there are lots of other things that plants need, um, micronutrients being one of them. Um, what, what the numbers mean on your package of 10, 10, 10? Well, it actually means a percent by mass. So if you have 50 pounds of fertilizer and you know 10% of that is available nitrogen, then it means that in that 50 pounds, there's a total of five pounds of usable nitrogen. Um, there's five pounds in this case of potash, which is your available potassium and five pounds of uh, phosphate. And the rest of it is all filler. It's all just stuff that, that, that that's filler, inert filler that has no um, value in terms of but but it's a way to transport that those nutrients so that way you're not overdosing your plants with uh, large amounts of fertilizer and leaving things like nitrogen burn and whatnot okay so what about yeah so what are, what else do plants need well what about the micronutrients they definitely need micronutrients you look at uh, tomatoes that are fairly far into their growth and if they run out of magnesium uh, they have all kinds of issues. Um, do they need organic matter? I'm pretty sure they do. Um, and in fact, bacteria and fungi, they need that and other life forms. Yep. All, all, they need all of them. Um, and in fact, most plant growth is a lot better when all of these things are around, uh, rather than just providing the soil with the inorganic components, providing with things that actually feed the soil. But once again, well, plants need those mineral forms, right? Um, they do. Um, and in fact, that, that's all they use. But luckily, nature got a lot of stuff figured out for us. Um, nature has a process. And the processes that we refer to them as are mineralization or immobilization. And in mineralization, basically, that process, um, the nutrients are stored in you know, living organisms. and when they decay and break down or are consumed or broken down by other, um, I guess, organisms in the soil, that leads to mineralization. So those, those things get released and now they're available for plant growth. But if other, let's say, organisms in the soil actually, um, for some reason, use these up, then they get immobilized and back into, you know, something living again. And then they're immobilized because they're not available anymore, but they're stored. So that the capacity to be able to use those nutrients is still there. It's just that it's not quite there yet because it's all living mass. So um, adding organic matter tends to build up that living mass and eventually you set up an equilibrium whereby basically the rate at which things are happening with mineralization is enough to feed, feed your plants. So in immobilization, um, the soil life basically uptakes those nutrients and they transform them into living matter, including microbial and plant tissues and etc. And in mineralization, you have the decomposition of living matter, which releases organic materials that can be broken down by the soil life. And um, there are other forms of mineralization. Take, for instance, nitrogen fixing bacteria on legumes. So peas and beans and those things, they oftentimes have uh, nodules. And those nodules are populated by soil bacteria. Sometimes you, you can buy inoculants that, that get this process going. And uh, the nodules actually are um, colonies of bacteria that literally harvest nitrogen from the air. Uh, they turn it into an inorganic component that uh, the plants can uptake. 
Um, so once again, one of these reasons why having living matter around it actually matters. Um, because in this case, the bacteria act symbiotically with the plant and provide a home. They have, the plant provides it a home, but they provide um, the plant a uh, source of nitrogen uh, in return. So I think that the take home message here, here is that adding organic matter matters and um, organic fertilizers feed the soil and synthetic fertilizers feed the plant and you know feeding soil life is really what you want to do that's not to say that fertilizers are really i guess a horror story they they're actually um you know they, they they can be used they can still be useful to us but we need to know how much to add and when to add it. And like I said, I, I keep harping on the soil test, but the soil test is one of the most important things you should do in the spring before you start adding anything. Cause you don't want to add it and have too much and it leads to all these other environmental issues. And if everybody does it, it's even a bigger problem. Okay, so this is the title, I guess, of the, the movie of what goes on in the underground. I call it the, you know, the underground horror saga. You know, just starring these guys, the living, the dead, and the really, really dead. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about these now. So it's kind of just a funny take on, I guess, what goes on underground. I mean, you know, it's basically a movie. It's always going on. And the synopsis is something like, you know, it's the, the living or eating the dead while providing li the living nutrients, creating more really, really dead, which are then decomposed by the living, which feed the really, really dead to the living. Like it's, it's a pretty wild, I guess, uh, story about what's going on underground, but it's a constant cycling of living and dead matter. And some of the stuff is actually kind of recently dead. Some of the stuff is living, but some of the stuff is really, really dead. And we'll talk about that as we go through. And those are kind of, really complex uh, molecules and stuff that are hard for nature to break down, but they can still actually feed the soil. And once again, it's, you know, kind of the cycling of, of nutrients in the ground. You see them, all these little molecules and whatnot. And, you know, they, they basically, you know, get broken down and they feed, they feed the roots of the plant. So what does all of this have to do with composting? Well, it's all important. Um, the fact is, is, Compost is much like soil, soil ecology. Uh, you're trying to create an environment uh, like an ecological ladder um, that's being described here. And it has many components that are very similar. You, know, you have living matter, you have dead matter, and you have really, really dead matter. Um, and the really, really dead stuff is stuff that kind of hangs around a, a long, long time, high carbon materials. So with that, um, let's move into uh, different types of composting. So this is part three. So first of all, I think it's important to define like what, what is composting. Uh, composting is in its, I guess, uh, definition is decomposition of organic materials into simpler organic and inorganic components. And really it's about uh, recycling products or byproducts in processes that are regarded as waste. Um, so kitchen scraps, you're not going to eat them, but uh, you know, it still can provide, um, you know, good organic material for your garden, for, for example. Um, it's a great way to create nutrient rich amendments for, for agriculture. I mean, something that everybody talks about, compost, 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 mulch for compost, add compost, a layer of compost, tilling your compost, the, like the amount of compost you could use in a garden is never ending. Okay, so the first one uh, method that I'm sure people have heard about, but they've not necessarily explored it, is vermicomposting. So vermicomposting is basically what you see in the person's hand is using worms. They're using worms to break down. So this is that soil ecology again. This is a, a component of the soil ecology that you're going to use to do most of the work for you. Now, some of the stuff is going to get break, broken down by bacteria and fungi and stuff, but for the most part, worms do, do most of it. So the benefits, of course, are that it can be done outside or indoors, depending on your climate. In our climate, a lot of people do it kind of outdoors in the summer, I think, and then they move their bins inside their garage. 
And it's really because the typical worms that they use for composting, they, they, they haven't naturalized here, and I don't think that they live here naturally. So um, you would need to actually uh, have some heat in order to be able to, to really, I guess, you know, keep them alive. Uh, it's fairly clean, it's odor free for the most part, as long as you, you know, cycle in the right amount of greens and browns. And uh, greens and browns, I'm sure, is something that everybody's heard of, and I'll get into that later. Um, and it's great for increasing soil organic contents. Um, it provides really, like compost, a slow release of nutrients that are further broken down by the soil life. It improves the porosity of the soil. A drainage um, it won't burn your plants um, and there are many many other benefits um, of course what people get out of the hot compost or the uh, vermicomposting is worm castings and well worm castings is is poop I mean it's it's worm poop that's exactly what it is um, but um, it pretty looks pretty like pretty much like dirt and sometimes if you go out in your lawn um, I've, I've been out there multiple times and I see these little clumps up sticking through the grass and that's usually what it is is castings from worms they're digesting everything uh, uh, below and they bring it to the top and they're, they're great cyclers of things that are deep and um, they're also cyclers of things that are high and high in the soil level and bringing it down so they, they tend to kind of cycle nutrients around quite a bit so another method that's very, very interesting, um, that's been something I've been meaning to try, is Bokashi, which is a type of fermentation. And in, in Bokashi, uh, the fermentation method uses um, microbes, and there are a whole bunch of them. Some of them are lac lacto-based uh, bacteria. Uh, this is an anaerobic method, so it doesn't require air, actually. The idea is it's completely anaerobic in nature. But you layer your food and then there are these bokashi, what they call grains, which is really just wheat husks or rice hulls that have been inoculated with microbes. And you, you put a layer of food and a layer of the bokashi grains and you press it all down. And uh, the bacteria migrate onto the food and then they, they, they start, I guess, digesting the sugars in the food. They produce an acid and uh, that acid then tends to break down the material. Um, so it's kind of an interesting one. And usually you can do it in bins and you get, you know, a bin and you get these Bokashi grains. You can see them in a bag here and the person sprinkled it on top. And then basically you put a cover on top of this. Sometimes you get some white mold and stuff, which is fine. And the mold actually helps break things down also. Beautiful thing about Bokashi is you potentially get two products out of the one. The runoff, I guess, from the excess liquid creates what's called a Bokashi tea and you also get bokashi compost and this can all be done inside there's very little smell except for you know pleasant odors of fermentation you don't get any smells like sulfides or anything like that they kind of tend to be sweet more kind of fruity fermentation smells it's a great option for winter around here if you're not doing hot composting and there's not really any greens or browns and you can basically throw in meat uh whatever whatever you got bones everything can go into bokashi unlike restrictions for other methodologies so with bokashi tea and compost basically you dig a trench and you literally you throw it in and then you bury it and you come back two weeks later and for the most part soil life is digested what's left for tea you dilute it you actually pour it at the bottom of the container and you dilute it and you can use it to water your vegetables directly. It's an interesting method. This method is the method that pretty much everybody uses, which is uh, cold composting. So co cold composting, I would call it a very passive approach. Um, there's very little work involved except for adding materials to your pile. The volume change in cold composting is actually very substantial, which means you're getting less compost, but it takes more time. So it's the opposite of what we want, which is more compost in less time. So the cold composting time is typically somewhere around six months, and that's because you're letting the soil life like worms and those things break it down, which can take a long time. Yeah, after a year, you're going to be pretty sad when you see that you only end up with a few shovelfuls of compost, but you got a full garden to feed. So the take home here is that there, there can be better methods, and the better method in my mind is the hot composting. It's, it's way better in terms of production 
than you know composting with uh, I guess the cold method. This is kind of typical of what you see when you think of a hot compost pile. It's a pile that's literally steaming and this is actually real. You, you can make piles steam. They can actually get very very hot and we'll talk about why that happens and why it's good. So hot composting I call it an active approach and uh, the reason is because you actually do have to put a little bit of work in but you know you let nature do the rest and then there's a little bit of work and then you let nature do the rest again so there, there are a few phases to it and uh, we'll map all of that out but it's thermophilic in nature meaning that it's decomposition that's dominated by all kinds of microbes and those microbes actually generate heat as they reproduce and as they actually digest. So there's some turning involved of the compost and there's some monitoring involved, but you have benefits like the heat can destroy pathogens and seeds. And you can compost all kinds of stuff that you kind of never expect, but it's actually quite good. Of course, there are some caveats, I guess, here. You need to use the right ratio of greens and browns. And there's that those terms greens and browns coming up again. Okay, so that's basically the methods of composting. Let's move into the next section, which is part number uh, four, hot composting. So this is what we're all getting to, but all the other stuff is kind of leading up to what hot, hot composting is and what it, what it's all about. So hot composting is a process of rapid decomposition of materials by high temperatures. And this method is performed mostly by a whole range of bacteria that tend to be thermophilic in nature. So thermophilic means temperature loving or heat loving. Um, so they're, they're bacteria that actually generate heat and they thrive in hot environments. And when I say hot, you're, you're going to find out in a while how hot that actually is. And, and you wonder, well, gee, how, is it, how, how is it even possible? Well, they've adapted to living under those conditions. And it's faster production of compost because, you know, you're adding energy, but you're not actually physically adding heat. You're letting the bacteria create that heat for you. You're able to do larger volumes quicker, and you're, you get more compost out in the end. The primary decomposition times are pretty short. You can kind of go to an 80% composted stage in about uh, 18 days or so, which is pretty, and that's, that's pretty impressive. And back to the picture, of course, of the steaming pile. This is basically what you end up getting is really hot compost. So some history, this is typically known as the Berkeley method. And it was developed at University of California in Berkeley, and it's fast, it's efficient, it uses high temperatures, and as I alluded to, it can produce compost in as little as 18 days. And it's aerobic in nature, so what that means is that the bacteria need to consume oxygen in order to be able to multiply. So there's anaerobic. So anaerobic is the processes that let's say you let's say would happen in a septic system. So it's the the type of bacteria that produce things like sulfur and the smell of rotting eggs. And those smells are tend to be anaerobic in nature. And then there are aerobic microbes which tend to produce other types of smells and they tend to produce a lot of heat and they need oxygen to do it. And like I said, from my experience, your compost is about 80% complete when, when the active heating stage is over. But there are some requirements for a successful burn, and you see that I have to burn as quote and unquote. So I haven't really ever seen anybody use, I guess, the term in this way. But uh, as a physicist, I, I think about things, you know, in terms of what's familiar. And well, a burn is something what happens when you literally start off a rocket booster. So it's when you initially burn a rocket booster, it's how long that burn lasts for. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and the analogy to, I guess, the burn or the rocket booster because the, the analogies are very, very similar. Okay, so the compost temperature needs to be maintained um, at 55, 65 Celsius. That's a requirement uh, in order to get the decomposition going well. 
the carbon to nitrogen balance, which means that the amount of carbon that you have compared to the nitrogen in it needs to be about 25 to 1. You can experiment a little with, with this, but I'm going to break down some, a really simple recipe for this. In order to generate heat, they say at least a cubic yard. I've done it down as far as a half of a cubic yard, and you can still generate you know, good heat in a, in a pile, especially in summer if it's only a, a, a half of a cubic yard. Large, high carbon materials should be mulched. For instance, it's no good to put a dead log in there, but if you have logs, you can easily chip them up and use that as your brown materials. You also need a constant source of oxygen. Well, we're lucky there. We're surrounded by air, and air has quite a bit of oxygen in it. We have lots of that surrounding us. Okay, so what are the prerequisites? Well, in order for us to raise the temperature, we need, well, a thermophilic organism. Well, we're lucky. They're all around us. We just don't realize it because we don't always create the right conditions for them to actually become thermophilic or to pr produce heat. We need a fuel source. So the fuel source is your carbons and your nitrogens. And those are what we refer to as the browns and the greens. So they're high carbon materials or high nitrogen materials. And we need enough fuel to get the pile decomposing and maintain decomposition. So like I said, a half a cubic yard to a full cubic yard, you easily get up to temperature. Lots of surface area, check, that's easy. I mean, a lot of these materials can be shredded. Take leaves, for instance. Leaves have lots of surface area. Uh, wood chips uh, make more sense than, let's say, a log of wood because it has more surface area. And oxygen. So check, we got all of these. We got all of these prerequisites fulfilled. It's easy to get all these things in your garden. It's easy to get paper. It's easy to get all kinds of stuff like oxygen. And luckily, when we shred things, you know, or we use things that have lots of surface area, we got that too. So we got all the prerequisites. Check on all of it. So what kind of organisms are in compost? So there's uh, actinomycetes, there's fungi and bacteria. And take, for instance, you go to bacteria, 100 million to 1 billion per gram of compost, a huge amount of biological matter. And if we look at, I guess, the, the populations of bacteria and uh, fungi in compost, you can see this This is the, the bar graphs that show the amount by dry weight and compost compared to fertile soil. You can see it's way, way up there. It's a lot more. Even though the soil is fertile and able to grow, compost basically you know, provides a, a huge amount of biological matter that can be used to, to, to break down that compost further to pro provide nutrients for plants. And these are some of the, I guess, some of the names of all these complicated organisms that fall under these groups of uh, actinomycetes, fungi, and bacteria. Some of these are actually bacteria that, like uh, Bacillus subtilis, is actually a hay, what you call hay bacteria. And then you, you see in here, I think that uh, the B. megagetarium, that, that's actually a bacteria that sometimes is used in fermentation. So some of these actually are things that we're actually eating on a daily basis. We just don't even realize that we're eating them. Okay, so fuel. Fuel for the burn. Okay, fuel for the burn. Browns. Okay, so your browns are, you know, your leaves and your wood chips. You know, paper, that kind of stuff. They're material that I would call, you know, they're really, really dead materials. In other words, they have lots of things in them called lignans or long chain inert molecules that are very, very hard to break down. They take a long time, but they provide a large carbon source for reactions like, like hot composting. And then you have greens. So greens are the kind of what they say they are. They're things that are, you know, recently living. They're green. They're still alive. So take, for instance, you know, recently cut grass. That's, that's a green. Anyway, the rest of the stuff in this pile is all just pretty much scrap. They're things that we wouldn't eat that now we want to recycle and uh, they contain a lot of nitrogen. All right, so the stars of the show are really the living, okay? They're, they're the ones that really get everything going. They're the thermophilic organisms. This is going back to that underground horror saga that I told you about before. You know, the living are really the thermophilic organisms in our compost pot. The dead, are you know things that are recently harvested high nitrogen materials so that would be you know your offcuts from your kale uh, weeds that you pull from your garden 
um, all of those things. Anything that was recently alive uh, is really the dead. And the really, really dead. The really, really dead are brown, high carbon materials, leaves, mulch, etc. So, what happens in a compost pile? So, uh, thermophilic bacteria tend to populate the pile and they use up that available nitrogen. And as they do that, they consume oxygen, which actually breaks down, helps break down that high carbon material as they populate the pile. So populating the pile, they're actually generating, they're actually generating their own body masses. They, they, they're, they're literally populating that pile, generating bacterial mass. But in that process, uh, they produce carbon dioxide and other products. And the reaction that they have is exothermic, so it produces heat. So this is where we're going to get that heat source from. It's free heat. We just need to provide them with the fuel. And of course, it te if the piles are big enough, the temperature rises. And um, it can stay going until, you know, your reactants, I guess, run out, whether that be oxygen or fuel or um, whatever, you know, they need in order to be able to populate the pile further. So, as I mentioned before, this is analogous to a rocket engine burn. So, if we look at, uh, I guess, a plot of the thrust versus time, we see that initially... Uh, the thrust is pretty low, but then it starts to increase, 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 and increase. And why it increases is because as the fuel starts to burn, you increase the surface area that's available to react. And uh, that produces more surface area, more surface area burns more fuel, more fuel then, you know, expels more gas, you get more thrust. Until eventually, well, uh, you, re you realize you start running out of fuel, and then it kind of says, well, I'm just going to cruise along now. And, you get this long tail that says, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still putting out thrust at a constant speed, like I'm still putting out thrust, but, but I'm not able to keep going with what I had before because the fuel is running out. So how is this analogous to hot composting? Well, the burn is really made up of the fuel, which is your materials. The oxidizer is your oxygen, and well, the catalyst, which is the thing that pushes the compost pile to creating compost is actually, so this, if you look back at the previous plot, um, you'll see the plot, and I'll go to the next guy, and this plot looks very similar, but this is a plot of temperature versus time in a compost heap, and we'll see it's broken up into stages, which are mesophilic, thermophilic cooling and stabilization, and this range thermophilic is the part, is really the area we want to get into. So as they start to populate the pile, the heat increases, and then they get into this thermophilic range where if the temperature goes too hot, what happens is they, they start to slow down or they start to consume all the fuel and oxygen, and eventually it starts to cool and stabilize. It's very similar. It's almost exactly the same physics. And of course, the catalysts in this case that actually make the fuel and the oxygen bind together to form themselves as well as the stuff that they need to produce, which is, you know, their excrement, the things that they excrete in order to be able to, to I guess, digest. Those things are all uh, in the pile, and we end up with these thermophilic organisms really end up being the catalyst to produce all of that reaction. So another diagram showing, you know, that this, this stage, is, this one's kind of a little more cartoony, but... But basically, uh, initially, you have a rapid uptake of soluble sugars and starches, and those things really feed those initial organisms. And then as the temperature starts to rise, these other guys kind of kick in and say, oh, wow, temperature's getting warm now. We can kick in and start doing some of our stuff. So then the temperature starts to get even higher. And eventually what happens is if it gets too hot, the population starts to decrease and the temperature starts to go down. So... Uh, the key is here is you need to add either more fuel or you need to do things to kind of jump start them again. But if you don't, it would just transition into this mesophilic stage. And basically what happens is in this stage, the temperature starts to decrease. Some of the fungi and bacteria are still doing their thing, but they're dominated now by digesting the really, really dead stuff, which is lignans and other kind of highly resistant compounds to, 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 to how they break down in nature. But they still produce good stuff for your soil that help with things like water retention and whatnot.
what are browns and what are greens. Uh, so there are comprehensive lists uh, that are available online. And here are some links that you guys can go to to see some of these. We will review some now in a minute. Uh, but I figured I'd put these in there because they're really good. But basically, recently dead material is green. For the most part, recently dead material is just green. So you can say, you know, I just picked a carrot and I peel it. The peel is green, even though it's orange. It's still called a green because it was recently, I guess, it's only recently dead. Uh, recently is a lot for if you want to look at it. Old dead material is brown. So paper. Paper is brown. Brown paper is brown. You know, wood chips, brown. Pretty much everything that you see is brown is something that's been dead for a long time or a while. There are some exceptions to the rule. Sometimes these, this is where clouds, how people build their compost and everything else. Oh, well, something went wrong. I don't know what happened. Well, it hasn't happened. Spent coffee grounds, despite being brown in color, are actually green. They're actually relatively high in nitrogen. Uh, brown kelp that you pull out of the ocean as uh, the type of kelp there are, there's actually three main types of kelps there's green greens browns and reds and regardless of their color if it's newly harvested kelp that hasn't broken down in any way it's green even though its color may not be green dry green hay recently cut that's now dried is actually green because it's loaded with uh, hay bacillus it still has nitrogen in it uh, brown hay that's been dead for a year in the field uh, is brown. It's easier to follow a list sometimes if you know there are questions about what's a brown and what is a green. So how much do we need to use? Because so they always cite this carbon to nitrogen ratio being 25 uh, to 1 by mass. I mean, how do you even go about measuring this out this is where it gets confusing for people because it's like well how much paper do i add how much you know wood chips do i add um you know 25 to 1 i have no idea what that means and and honestly like it's a lot to keep track of um so if you look for instance at how much carbon is in certain materials compared to nitrogen for instance wood chips wood chips have a carbon to nitro nitrogen ratio of 400 to 1 which means that for every 400 carbon atoms there's like only one nitrogen atom but if you go down that list to let's say leaves it, uh, it's 60 to 1 so it's like okay well if i'm going to use wood chips is it going to be different than if i'm going to use leaves so like they're all different so how do you choose greens now if you look at greens greens tend to have ratios that are more like you know less than 30 to 1 so uh weeds they say 30 to 1 uh, green wood, so that's be recently cut wood that's chipped, let's say, would be 25 to 1. Horse manure, 18 to 1, so it's a high nitrogen source. Uh, fish, 7 to 1. Wow, so this is why fish work so well for fertilizing your garden, because the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is actually really, really low, which means that, you know, it has a lot of nitrogen compared to the carbon that it has. And, well, people use it. I've never tried it, but... There are places that are looking at harvesting, you know, uh, human urine for, for fertilizer because it actually has active fertilizing components in it. And it's one to one. So it's really good fertilizer if it can be uh, used properly. So in, I guess, in, in terms of hot composting, I typically tend to use uh, leaves. Leaves are readily available. But the key is, is that this time of the year, unless you've got a huge amount of leaves that you didn't rake in the fall, where are you going to get them? Well, um, you need to look ahead. And if you're going to use leaves, I find that using leaves is easy because I can get a large, a large amount of them, but I collect my leaves all in the fall. So I usually, um, I'm the guy that's going up and down the streets in the fall in St. John's, and I actually stop my truck on the side of the road. And I fill up with those those leaf bags that people have put in on the side of the road. And I, I'm sure they're wondering that I, if I'm the garbage guy or not. But I go up and down and I get at least three or four truckloads of maple leaves. And typically I, I try to shop around. I go to areas of St. John's that I see that have maple leaves. And there's a reason for that. So if we look down through this list of species of trees, they have, you know, all these names and whatnot. But the take home here is that that maple trees, which are some of the lower uh, lignin trees, and this one, um, 
there's a couple here I think that like Acer Sacarum that's a that's a maple so you see it's it's 10.8 lignin content 5% weight so there's a very low lignin count so the lignin are the materials that make up the structure of the plant so remember I said that's the really really dead so that's the stuff that hangs around a long 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 time in your compost it hangs around a long long time in your soil so if you're going to choose tree leaves, try to stay away from pine needles, try to stay away from uh, fir tree needles, try to stay away from oak tree leaves. They tend to be higher in lignin. Maple and birch works really, really well because they have a low lignin count and the carbon is way more accessible than, than the other ones. But get your leaves in the fall because it's the only time you're going to get them. So there's actually a simpler recipe here. Rather than saying, well, I need to figure out how much to add to, you know, to, I guess, to make it 25 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. And the simple recipe is, is that by volume, you say, okay, if I got one part green, so imagine I got a, a one gallon bucket filled with greens. I throw my greens in my bin and then basically I add one and a half to two parts of browns by volume. So um, if that's, you know, crushed up uh, maple leaves uh, compared to, let's say, uh, you know, um, wood chips, the actual carbon by volume actually works out to be about the same regardless of the, the, the thing because the weights are all different. So um, this recipe is very, very simple. You don't need to really remember, you know, any of the stuff about the carbon and nitrogen ratios. Just remember one part greens to one and a half to two parts browns. That's all you need to remember. And if you're in that, in that area, it'll be fine. So I want to tell you that the best thing you can do is just find browns that work well for you and are accessible in your area. For me, maple leaves or something that's accessible if you have a place that let's say cuts wood and you guys are using things like that for your chicken bedding uh, like uh, wood chips and uh, sawdust and stuff that can also be used as your browns so really what that is is your your eggshells you can consider to be brown they're not actually brown they, they you, you can crush these up and they just add calcium they actually add quite a bit of calcium to your soil if you get your soil and your uh, your compost tested but it's simple, one part greens to one and a half to two part browns. Really simple. And as I said, greens are your fresh materials. Browns are, well, the dead materials. And you need air, oxygen, and you need, okay, so here is the magic ingredient. This is really the thing that most people don't realize is that your compost needs water. And this is where you need water in a three com a three bin method. So I'm going to get into that in a minute. So I compost using what's called a three bin method. Now you can have many bins, as many as you want, but I've gotten used to doing it this way. So my three bins are an, an active pile, which is number one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I actually fooled that up. Um, number one is actually my storage pile. And number two is actually my active pile. I'm very sorry about that. I actually meant to flip that around and must have missed it. Um, so like I said, one is my storage pile, two is my active pile, and three is my curing pile. And in my storage bin, really all I'm doing is when I go out from my kitchen with my bucket full of materials, I literally throw it in top of my storage bin, I throw it inside, and then I get a bucket and a half, let's say, of my brown leaves. I crush them down a bit in the bucket. So I got about a bucket and a half, and I throw them in on top of the kitchen scraps. If I have a one gallon bucket filled with chicken manure, I bring that in, I throw it on top of the previous browns that are already there, because I'm always layering browns on my top. That's what I'm always doing. I put my browns on the top, and there's a reason for that, which I'll, I'll talk to you in a second about. And I throw my chicken manure on top of that, and then I throw a layer of browns on top of the chicken manure. So that would be my leaves again. So if I have a gallon of chicken manure, I throw it in kind of, I just, you know, you kind of spread it out on top of it, right? You just throw it in on top. And then I take a layer of browns. That's about one and a half parts of whatever I threw in on top of the chicken manure. So you always get these layers, basically, that are being built up. You kind of aim it in the end 
for a storage bin that has somewhere between a half a cubic yard to here to showing a full cubic yard. So it's three by three by at least kind of three feet, um, you know, back. So it's like a cube is the way they're showing it. In bin number two is my active pile. And really, the active pile is actually pretty simple. All you need to do is you take everything from, from your, your first bin. So your first bin now, you notice that I'm all I was doing was layering and I'm never adding any water to it. I'm just adding dry leaves on top of everything. And the reason why I'm doing that is that the dry leaves that I add, they absorb smells. They actually can absorb quite a bit of moisture from the stuff that you're adding to the pile already. And what happens is because the pile is not wet, it actually doesn't become active. So it can sit there for quite a long time without becoming hot. And that's, that's the key here. You don't want the, the storage bin to become hot. You need that to happen in bin number two or pile number two. It doesn't have to be done in bins. These can be done in open piles if you want. So in my active pile, what happens is I, I take everything from bin number one and I throw in a layer and then I basically water it down with a watering hose. And I water it down until it looks like all the dry leaves are dripping. And I'm going to show you guys this when we actually do the outside component. And what happens is you, you water that layer until it's dripping. And then you take another layer out of your first bin. You throw it into your second bin and you water that layer down again. You keep doing that. You're basically taking a layer from your, your, your first bin. And I usually use a manure fork, fork for this and I push it all into my second bin and I'm watering the layers as I'm adding them. And that water actually helps a lot. And what it does is it actually increases the, the ability for the bacteria to become mobile. So it is the secret ingredient. Although water, you know, you think, well, water puts out fire and it makes heat go away. In this case, it actually causes the bacteria to become mobile and they can actually move around and start digesting things. So then what happens is it starts to heat up. So water is really the secret ingredient here. So after four days or so, you're basically at about 60 Celsius. It's pretty hot in there and the temperature will con continue to rise. And when the thermometer really hits kind of 55 Celsius, rather than getting above 60, it's a good idea to, to mix your material. So what does that mean? So what that means really is, is you take the components that are outside and kind of pile them into a wheelbarrow or outside of your bin. And then you take the stuff that was in the middle and you actually distribute it to your sides. So that, that's what this is really showing. You're turning your, your compost pile inside out. So the, the hotter parts of the pile now, you're moving to the outside. And the cooler parts that were on the outside, you're moving to the middle so that you can distribute things around and it can compost more readily. And of course, while actively cooling the pile actually also ensures that the temperature doesn't get so high that it kills the active, I guess, thermal bacteria. After another two to three days, the temperature of the pile interior will go up again and then you turn it one more time. And if you've got a lot of nitrogen there, you may have to turn it another time. So usually two to three times, you'll end up having to turn it. And of course, what happens is that eventually, well, after several turns, you realize, okay, it's not heating up anymore. So if it's not heating up, then there, there could be a couple of problems. And one of those might be that, well, your nitrogen source has run out, your carbon source has run out. Um, maybe you're not getting enough oxygen because the pile is too wet but I'll show you the recipe for how much water you need to add once we actually build a pile in the second session, which I'll do outside. And it'll all become a little more apparent, I guess, at that point. This is mainly the theory section. So, so after several turns, you're gonna find that, that you, you don't need to turn the compost pile again. It'll start to slowly cool down. And if you look at that plot up above now, the arrow is down to the section here where it's like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool now. Like it's down to maybe 25, 30 Celsius. And this is now when we reach that stage called stabilization. So when you start to turn this stuff now, you'll, you'll basically start to see that most of it's broken down. There's nothing really in there anymore that has, um, you know, it does, 
visibly it doesn't look like anything that's discernible like you can't tell that turnip fields are turnip fields anymore it's pretty much all broken down into things that you'd be like oh wow like it's pretty crazy how much this is broken down maybe 80 percent if i could guess and you kind of need to wait for that to cure which might take you know you you could wait another 15 days if the longer you wait the better it, it will continue to break down but in essence the bulk of the the work is done in an 18 day period you can use this product as mulch or you can sift it. I do both depending on what it is that you want to do. And uh, if you're trying to work in between vegetables, sifting it could help. But if you're just mulching stuff in the fall, like your garlic, for instance, just throw it on top. You don't even need to, to, need to sift it. The, the worms and everything else will take care of all the work for you. So the longer you wait in that stabilization phase, the better. Some people introduce worms at this point and uh, this can tend to speed things up a little bit. Worms will populate the pile if you have it in a place where it's on the ground. And it's important, you should get your compost tested. So we're aiming for 25 to one, but we're using a simple recipe, which is really just one part greens to one and a half, two parts browns. I always end up getting a carbon to nitrogen ratio that's somewhere around 22. I've seen as low as 19, which is good also. Uh, but it shouldn't be higher than 25 to 1. And the reason why is that if you take, let's say, uncomposted brown leaf matter and you throw it in your soil, the soil bacteria are going to want to eat up that carbon source. And in order to do that, they need to use nitrogen that's now in your soil. So they, they use this term that it locks up available nitrogen in your soil. So this goes back to what we were talking about before with, with mobilization and immobilization. So the the... the the immo I guess the immobilization is now caused by the fact that bacteria and living organisms in the soil want to eat those high carbon sources. So now the nutrients that normally would be uptaken by your plants are now used up. They're, 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 they're stored in a living mass that needs to break down eventually to feed your soil. But it's better if you've got carbon nitrogen ratios that are lower than 25 to 1. I don't have a slide for this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about troubleshooting. Uh, mainly because it's going to come up during during the next session and the thing is is how do you know that you've done it right well if you've used the simple recipe and you've layered the materials and you've added the right amount of water which I'm going to show you in the first the next session you're going to see first of all that your temperature starts to rise okay so your temperature is rising okay so if after let's say a day or so your temperature starts to drop what does it mean what what's what's going on well, um, you, you need to go back and you think, hey, what's going on in my pile? Well, we know, for instance, that we need some prerequisites. The pile needs to have the right amount of fuel, which means it needs to be about a half a cubic yard to a cubic yard. It needs to have the right ratio of greens and browns, so that's the recipe, which is one to one and a half to two parts, um, I guess, uh, uh, greens to browns. And it needs to have water. So if any of those things are off a little bit, it could cause the pile to stop warming up. So if you dig into the pile, or you put a thermometer in the pile and you see the temperature's decreasing, you realize, okay, well, something's going on. Maybe all my nitrogen's used up. So you'll know quite quickly because, you know, if you put in uh, one part, let's say greens to one and a half, two parts browns, and uh, it doesn't heat up, then, you know, that it'd be funny. My, my first thought would be that there's not enough water in the pile. You haven't created an environment for the, the bacteria to become mobile, so they can't eat anything up. The pile's too dry. If the pile heats up excessively, really, really quickly, and when you go out and you dig into it, you smell ammonia. So kind of that smell that you'd expect from Windex. That means that you put too much nitrogen in the pile, and the pile gets super hot super quick. So you know, the easy way to fix that is you just throw in more browns and mix it around. You know, there's, there's going to be lots of, I guess, ways for you to determine if the pile is not working properly. And we'll get into that in the next uh, session.